Hello, this is Dave Lee Travis, and welcome to my Top 10 Auto Show. Each week, we look at the top 10 vehicles from the different automotive categories, as voted by our panel of experts from the top UK auto magazines. This week, we're taking a look at the top 10 hatchbacks of 2001. First off, at number 10 is the cutie car, the Vauxhall Corsa. The best asset of the Vauxhall Corsa was always its good looks, and the sales figures benefited by it. But while it has the looks on the outside, the interior didn't impress Richard Hammond. Tart de boudoir, I think, is the best way to call it. If you like things flash, you'll love it. If you're a fan of subtlety, or dare I say it, quality, you won't. The plastics are mismatched. There's about 15 shades of grey in here. There's more textures than can possibly be necessary. And I'm sorry, this car is only a few thousand miles old and already it's showing signs of wear and scratches. Put another 30, 40,000 miles on this and it will be a sack of spanners. But even though it was popular, the QT Corsa never really gave much competition when it came to appeal behind the wheel. The latest edition has taken heed of this and has made many improvements, but also some blunders. Considering it's a car that I've never associated with high tech, it's a surprise to find the Corsa boasting the most sophisticated gearbox of the three, the Easytronic. Basically, it's another of these systems you slide the gear lever across into A for automatic, and it's an automatic. Or you can slide it, knock it across once, and you can move it plus or minus, it'll change up and down the gears. Honest opinion? Total waste of time! The automatic gearbox isn't particularly smooth. You'll get bored of going, ooh, first, ooh, second, ooh, first. You're not really changing gear. It's just a switch on an automatic gearbox. Sorry, Vauxhall, can't see the point. Stick to an automatic or a manual, one or the other. So, Richard, to sum up. Boy and girl racers alike will prefer the Corsa from Vauxhall. They'll love its edgy styling and it's quite nippy. Others will think that, frankly, it's a little bit tacky. Well, as a wise man said, you can't please all the people all of the time. In at number nine is the up-and-coming hatchback from Malaysia, the Proton Satria. I'm sure the people at Vauxhall will be horrified to find their Corsa scoring lower than the Proton, but I would think that the people at Proton are getting pretty sick of their Satria being knocked just because it lacks a trendy badge. The Proton Satria is based on Mitsubishi's previous generation Colt hatchback, so if you're looking for something new, you won't find it here. What you will find is a very decent car at a reasonable price and with a great warranty. The technology may not be cutting edge, but it is proven. So, is there anything new on Proton Satria? Yes, the 1.8 GTI chassis from uh, Lotus. OK, so it's a little bit garish, perhaps, but come on, this is a GTI. It's a hot hatch, that's what we want. If you want subtle and understated, go buy a Rover. If sporty little touches are your thing, though, this has got to be the place to be. It's got every single style you, see you could find on a hot hatch. Chrome gear knob, little chrome bolts and rivets everywhere, little chrome pedals down here by my muddy feet, and these spectacularly comfortable Recaro seats. But surely Proton can't make a fun GTI, can they? The Proton is loud, very loud, most of it through road noise. The steering is fast and direct with plenty of feel, and the same can be said for the brakes. Once you discover that most of the power is actually in a narrow mid-range band, then it's very easy to exploit it. As for the rest of the Satria range, well, it may not be cutting edge, but the price tag is relatively low for its class. It is cheap, but not nasty. But it's not the top of its range either. It's comfortably in the middle. A sensible choice, if you want to be sensible. Number 8 is the Toyota Yaris. As the TV ad says, they've rewritten the script, and it's a good job, as the name Yaris sounds far more serious than Starlet, the car the Yaris replaces. The Yaris may have come number eight in our top ten, but that's voted on by our expert panel, and the great British car-buying public thought differently. 
In the recent JD Power Customer Satisfaction Survey, car owners voted the Yaris number one. And that's not just in the hatchback category, but overall cars sold in the UK. So what did our average Joe, Richard Hammond, think of the Yaris? Some of the plastics used in here, though, aren't exactly inspirational, but the standard of finish is perfectly decent. And being a Toyota, I'm sure it will last a long time. It is never going to be the prettiest interior. Clever, though, we've got things like this long distance rev counter and speedo, which means you don't actually have to refocus. You can just glance your eyes down, read it, and back up without refocusing the distance that you're looking at. Sounds like a gimmick, actually works once you've got used to it. It makes good use of the available space, mostly through its sliding back seat, which can provide comfortable legroom in the rear or give extra boot space. There's also plenty of headroom thanks to the high roof, which gives the impression that the Yaris is more like a mini MPV. The Yaris is built on good foundations. Although the suspension and steering are currently set for comfort, there's potential in the chassis for more. But let's go back to Richard for the last word. The Yaris's eccentricity is both its strength and its downfall. Some will love it, others will think, well, it's just plain loopy, isn't it? At number 7 is the first French hatch in our top 10, the Renault Clio. The Clio has always been popular, but Renault has been recently tweaked to help it keep up with new cars on the market. In fact, it's more than just a tweak as up to 50% of the new Clio is different to the old one. The new Clio is bigger than its predecessor but lacks headroom. However, if you're not bothered about interior space but do want power and speed, then Glenda Mackay has the Clio for you. Now to most of us, me included, the Renault Clio is a lovely little French shopping trolley. It's the perfect run-around accompaniment to his beam apart from the gravel drive. I mean, the kit on this car looks a bit like it's from a Star Wars film. And believe it or not, there isn't even a back seat. The lovely little run-around engine has been replaced by some throbbing great V6. To be honest, I wouldn't want to be seen dead driving around in a car like this. But what about the more practicable and affordable Clios? Well, the benchmark for specification is quite high, with ABS, power steering, four airbags, central locking, remote stereo controls, and rain-sensing wipers as standard. You do get your money's worth. At number six is the latest incarnation of the Honda Civic. The Civic is now on its seventh generation, and after selling a whopping 13 and a half million of the last six models, so why have Honda felt they need to update it? Well, it's just a bit boring, isn't it? No, not anymore. Honda are now aiming the Civic towards a younger market and have made changes accordingly. Well, Honda haven't been quite as brave in here. It's a bit dark and there is far too much black plastic. Why do manufacturers keep on using it? Because it just looks awful. What they have done, though, is rearrange things. It's very streamlined and everything does feel very good quality. There are a couple of unusual touches as well, like this strangely positioned gear stick, familiar to people that drive an MPV or a van, but very unusual in a hatchback. Apparently, as well as freeing up some floor space down there, its closeness to the steering wheel means that it's easier to change gear. The seats in the back, however, are too low, meaning you have to stretch your legs out, but there isn't enough room for that. Standard equipment is generous with excellent air conditioning, powered steering and electric windows to list a few. If you're going to do most of your driving around town, then the Civic would not be a bad choice at all. As for the open road, you'll find agile handling and class-leading grip and feedback, but no excitement. Put it this way, you won't be getting out of a Civic with a big smile on your face, unless you're driving the R-Type, of course, but I'll let Ginny Buckley have the last word. I've got to say, I think this seventh generation Civic will win itself lots of new friends. The question is, would I buy one? I mean, I'm just the kind of person that Honda are trying to attract. And I've got to say, I think I would. It's a good value car, it's good quality, 
And what's more, I even like the way it looks. Oh no, a Honda Civic. I'm getting old. In at number 5 is the Audi A3. Despite being built on the platform of the Golf Mark IV, the A3 is definitely an Audi inside and out. The Audi looks, image, quality build and interior are all superb with the A3. For an extra grand, you can make your A3 more uh, grand with leather interior. The drive, however, is still considered to be impassive and remote despite improvements, which includes Audi's electronic stability program, which is now standard on all A3s. for money is definitely a 3 strong point. These Audis have been holding on well up to 58% of their prices and so make a good investment. The diesel A3 is also amazingly cheap to run with up to a staggering 57 miles to the gallon. What we're looking for here is fun which the Audi A3 delivers in huge quantities. And it may sound an odd thing to say about an Audi over a Peugeot, but the A3 will in fact be the cheaper car to run over a longer term. All of which means if you're in the market for a hot hatch like this, then something like this must be a realistic value for money alternative. Hello, this is Dave Lee Travis, and welcome to my Top 10 Auto Show. This week, we're taking a look at the Top 10 Hatchbacks of 2001. At number 4, Citroen Saxo. Thanks to a recent facelift, the Saxo has moved on, visually at least, from the 106 on which it's based. Changes mostly sent around a new dashboard and exterior. There's a massive amount of room. It's a typical hatch. Convenient, everything to hand, a nice size, you can see out clearly, and it's warm and dry. But beauty is only skin deep, and underneath this Citroen, a Peugeot heart still beats, and beats very well. You sat inside a hot hatch, but in fact, apart from the nice blue dials, you wouldn't really know there was anything hot about it at all. You just sat in an ordinary car. It's not until you mash the right pedal do you realise this thing is very fast indeed. Front wheel drive, so it's a totally different experience and it is extremely quick. It's typical hot hatchery in here. All the power going to the front wheels, they're only two ready to brake traction and spin. It goes around corners incredibly quickly. The Saxo is, however, a nippy little thing. Handling on even the basic Saxos is good, but for real fun, look at the performance models. The 1.1 litre is perfect for getting around in and fun if the road from A to B is a windy one. The 1.6 VTS with its 16 valves gives an exciting ride as it gets you to 60 miles per hour in 7.7 .7 seconds, some of what you want from your hot hatch. At number three is the Volkswagen Golf. Being Europe's best-selling car, the Golf is both a popular car for the masses and a chic must-have for those who consider that kind of thing important. This one is Mark IV, and no, that's not the speed. Okay, bad jokes aside, this is the fourth Golf to come from Volkswagen, and it comes with a feeling of quality that's the envy of others. 
The interior is very stylish and ergonomic. The solid fascia is simple and chunky and comes in a range of colours other than just black. And on the road... This is a great, if somewhat noisy car to travel smoothly and sedately round town in. But put your foot down and it will respond quite eagerly. Get it out onto the country roads, work your way through the notchy six-speed gearbox and you're going to be having a lot of fun. Despite having excellent fuel consumption, an admirable 54 miles to the gallon on the 1.9 TDI and equally impressive resale value, the pricing of the new Golf lets it down. Now, when the Golf was launched, it was supposed to have mass market appeal, which it did have, but somewhere along the way, VW forgot that philosophy because at a tad under £17,000, this car is now encroaching on BMW 3 Series territory, but VW still insists on marketing it against the likes of the Ford Focus and the Vauxhall Astra. So, this Golf has got twice as many competitors as all of its rivals, which can outdo the Golf on most things, including the price. At number two is the Peugeot 206. It's had to be the son of a successful father, and that's probably how the 206 feels when it's constantly compared to the 205, the car which was great in its day, but even better in people's memories. But you're not getting the 205 back, so stop going on about it. It may well be able to trace its line directly back to one of the original small hot hatches, but the 206 GTI feels about as big as the factory that they built the original 205 in. But that said, once you are in here, it's a, a very nicely understated cabin. It does feel very well designed with lots of nice touches. I do like the sporty little instrument binnacle and the little chrome gear lever. So why, oh why do we have a reappearance of this awful textured plastic? It looks cheap and feels nasty and tacky. I do like the suede effect and leather though. Very sporty. Ironically, the 206 is built in Britain and exported back to France. Like the Ford Focus, the 206 scored top marks on Euro NCAP crash tests. Along with the usual safety features, the 206 also has automatic unlocking doors in the event of impact a panic button in the centre console for central locking and pyrotechnically pretensioned front seat belts. The ride is soft and comfortable and the controls are very light and easy to use. But hang on, this is a hot hatch. The old 205 felt like a go-kart. This begins to feel perhaps a little too grown up. The light steering could be seen to be remote and rather distant. Whereas in the 205 you felt every bump and ripple in the road through the controls, the brakes in particular on the 206, though very effective, could be operated by somebody else's feet. So, to sum up, the 206 is very good. It just doesn't have the same satisfying thrill the 205 did, but it wouldn't, would it? Before we find out what is the number one hatchback of 2001, let's run down the top 10 so far from 10 to 2. In at number 10, beauty is only skin deep with this cutie, the Vauxhall Corsa. At number 9, better than you think, all the way from Malaysia, the Proton Satria. At number 8 is the JD Power number 1, the Toyota Yaris. At number 7, 50% newer than the old one, the Renault Clio. In at number 6, they even moved the gear stick to make extra room, the Honda Civic. At number 5, based on the VW Golf but unmistakably an Audi, the A3. And at number 4, it's a 106 underneath but on top it's a Citroën Saxo. At number 3, Europe's best-selling car, the Volkswagen Golf. And at number 2 from the creators of the hot hatch, the Peugeot 206. And so on to the number one hatchback of 2001 as voted for by our panel of auto experts from the UK's top automotive magazines. When updating the Escort, Ford discovered that they had created a whole new car and therefore decided it needed a whole new name and so called it the Focus. The bold new body shape is not a typical Ford style and not to everyone's taste but despite this, the Focus is selling very well, leading the field as the best in its class. Now, 
Whether or not you like the exterior is going to be the deciding factor in whether you like the interior, because it's quite obvious that Ford's outside body designers and inside designers all sit next to one another in the canteen, because they've got together and brought just about every styling design cue from the outside inside. Personally, I don't like it. I think it's trying too hard. There's lines and slashes and curves and ovals everywhere, but in its defence, it works. Everything falls to hand. So ergonomically, top marks. Style-wise, you'll love it or hate it. The ride and handling are exceptional, a feeling that's felt all the way through to the quality build. Inside, Doctor Who would feel very at home. There's bags of room, more than you'd think, thanks to the intelligent way space is utilised. They don't come much more family orientated than this particular hatchback. So obviously practicality and ergonomics are important, but also those safety features. The fact that it's done so well whenever it's been tested for crash safety is extremely important. And more and more people are deciding their car purchases in this sector by safety. That should make the focus a bit of a winner. There's a long list of engines available for the Focus, giving the buyer the greatest amount of choice to decide what's best to suit their needs. However, with so many options, it may prove confusing to some. All in all, the Focus is a great drive and a very competitive package, a real winner from Ford. This is Dave Lee Travis saying thanks for watching. See you next week for the chart of the top 10 performance cars.